We open up the mailbag to answer your question about Tyler Hero's continued growth and whether he's taken the next leap. If we're seeing the beginning of the Adebayo Hero phase in Miami, and are there other options at point guard that could improve Miami's chances this season? All that and more in today's episode of Locked on Heat. You are Locked on Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome to Locked on Heat, your daily podcast on the Miami Heat. I'm Wes Goldberg. Joining me as always, David Ramil. However, you're tuning in on YouTube. Odyssey, your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150. If your team wins, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. Well, we're going to open up the mailbag in today's episode. David, we've got a ton of questions about uh, whether this is the first phase of a new rebuild, a new era in mm-hmm. Miami. We'll explain that a little bit later, plus some point guard options that the Heat um, can use later on. And then, of course, we'll talk about some stuff about the rotation when we get into those mailbag questions. But I wanted to surprise you to start the show, David, with a new, with a new segment that I'm going to call Real or Fake. So we're about six mm-hmm. games into the season now. and I thought I could take we could take a look at some trends here, and I'm just going to ask you if those trends are real or fake. Pretty simple. Are you Sounds ready? Good. Sounds good. Absolutely. All right. The first one is about Tyler Hero, who is averaging career highs in points, rebounds, assists, and steals. Do you think that's real or fake? And I think we could just start. You, you can either tell me if all of it's real or fake, or you could go category by category if it's real or fake. I think all of it's real. I think he's taking uh, an improved leap in terms of his decision making he's had some on off games but i think more often than not he's shown that he's making better decisions overall and i know that people and i'll I'll take this time to to address this because people are leaving comments specifically directed at me because i was critical of him after two games or three games into the season since then he's been a lot better about his scoring his drives to the basket his pace overall and when he takes those shots within the shot clock context and i think he's done a lot better in that regard. He's not just the scorer. I think that there are still moments, and unfortunately the Lakers game was a step back for him in some regards, where he was trying to force it a little bit. He looked like he was a little sped up, in my opinion, and he wasn't taking with the same kind of patience that he had in the previous three games. But overall, I think this is an improvement from him, and I think he's going to continue to get better as the season progresses, as he figures out his place among Bam Adebayo and Jimmy Butler as the you know, the, the de facto big three of this current era of Miami Heat basketball. I want to talk about the steals. He's averaging 1.4 steals per game, yes. which would be basically double his previous career high. Uh, I think it's real. I think uh, I remember talking with Tyler Hero before the season started, and I kind of was asking him about a bunch of different things. And he mentioned that he purposely wants to get more steals this year. Um, this is somebody who I think is sort of finding his voice on the defensive end. He kind of came to the realization last year that he's never going to be a great defender just based on his size and his negative wingspan. It's just never going to happen for him. Just physically, he's always going to be a target out there. And I remember when he made those comments publicly, people were like, oh no, like you need to feel like you could be the best defender. And like, no dude, realistic goals. Like that's number one rule of goal setting is realistic and attainable. And his realistic and attainable goal on the defensive end is to be average. Just like Steph Curry, just like, a lot of other kind of undersized guards that right. with physical limitations, that's your best outcome. And so Tyler here realized, all right, I'm just always going to be a target out there. LeBron's and Kawhi's and Kevin Durant's are always going to come after me because they're just bigger, stronger, uh, faster than I am. And so that's just going to be the case. But what can I do? And I think he's realizing now he's like, what can I do to just, I'm not going to end defensive possessions by just like stonewalling LeBron, but can right. I end a defensive possession by creating a turnover? And, He's averaging 1.4 steals per game. He's using that on-court vision and that anticipation that makes him such a great offensive player to his on the defensive side of the ball. He is jumping passing lanes before you even see them. I I I, uh, I'm working on a piece right now for all you can heat that that's kind of exploring this a little bit more. And I've got some clips in there about how like he's just seeing these loose balls and the the, and the balls up in the air before they're even up in the air before the passes are even made. He's so fast with it. Uh, yes. He's being more physical in those passing lanes too, 
which is he, he basically stopped two Austin Reeves, LeBron James pick and rolls on Monday night. One of them, he just basically bumped Austin Reeves out of the way, stole the ball from LeBron, and then he went and scored the other way, which LeBron had the goal 10 block there, and, and, and Tyler Hero got credit for the basket. So I, I love what he's doing defensively. I think he's really found a way to make them back there. Yeah, I, I love that you bring up the anticipation because I think that's always been a big part of what makes him a plus def- uh, a rebounder at his size and position. Mm. He's always had a real good knack for figuring out exactly where the ball is coming off, where it's going to carry him. Uh, and he has incorporated that into being able to steal the ball and, and turn over the, the uh, possession as well. So I, I think it's all tying together. He's how always had the physical and mental tools. And he's a high IQ, IQ player. Everybody kind of sees him. He's young. No, no, he's been in the league now for four plus seasons. He knows what to do. And I think he's figuring it out. And he's in, if he's making a concerted effort defensively, I think it's going to continue to pay dividends. Real or fake, Duncan Robinson averaging his fewest three-point attempts per 100 possessions since he became a, re- a regular staple in the rotation. Is that real or fake? Uh, I think it's real. You and I have talked about it before. I think the versatility in his game, the way Spo uh, addressed it before the game, or maybe it was after the Lakers game, I think it's continuing to show a different look. You know, they always talk about versatility, and the the fact is, Teams around the league started limiting what ta- what Duncan could do from the three point line, challenging him there. He had to find other ways of making a positive impact. I think we're going to continue to see that balance of three point shooting and drives to the basket. Thirty percent of his shots this year are from two point range. Wow, his previous career high was nineteen percent. Yeah, that's a different that's player. Double. It's a different yeah. player. That's a different player completely. Uh, it's crazy. Real or fake? Bam Adebayo shooting fifty percent on threes this season. He's one of two. <laughs> uh, I think that's fake, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't think that's sustainable 50%, but I'd like to see him. I don't know what his career high is because it's so little. I, I just matter. can't imagine. It yeah, literally doesn't I, matter. One three-pointer a game, maybe? I and mean, that's probably that. even too high, but I, I would think that that's probably like within his wheelhouse of possibility. And if he can average 30% on those, I'll take it. And I think the Heat would, too. I could if he averages zero percent on it, I, I'm fine with it. If he if he just takes one well, per game in the flow of the offense, that doesn't hurt your offense at all. If anything, even if he's just taking them, yeah, I don't know. Eventually, I, he has to make them for guys to step up to it. So I I'm kind of being hyperbolic when I say zero percent per game. But I just if I were him, I wouldn't care about the percentage. You know, is what I'm I'm trying to say. Just take it. Just take yeah, one. He's not going to hijack the offense. The offense. No, he's exactly. not going to do that. He would never. So do if, that. if he's out there above the break and he has the ball in his hands from three point line, just let it fly. And I want it like within the first ten seconds of the shot clock, not this end of the shot clock bailout heat. No, just within the first ten seconds of the shot clock, they're six feet off of you, daring you to shoot it. All right, take the dare, shoot it, see what happens. Jimmy Butler last four games. One of two from three-point range. Zero for two from three-point range. One for two from three-point range. Three for four from three-point range. He's making 50% on 2.5 three-point attempts per game after not taking any threes in the first two games of the season uh, in the last four games. David, is this real or fake? 50% on 2.5 three-point attempts per game. Let's focus on, he's not going to shoot 50%. I already made that joke. But 2.5 three-point attempts per game. I think that's very real. I think it's a realization that now... If you, as you have the ball in Tyler's hands more to let him continue to explore a larger role in offense, and as Tyler continues to find his balance between the three-point shot and drives to the basket, the pull-up mid-range game, which is one of his greatest strengths, I think you're going to need to see Jimmy guys kind of flare out to the perimeter to create a little bit more spacing for Tyler to allow him to work. So I think we're going to start to see more and more of those three-point attempts coming during the regular season. Uh, I'm going real as well. Actually, when you look Back before his time in Miami, he was averaging 2.7 three-point attempts per game before his time in Miami. He got to the heat, maybe just the the ghost of Dwayne Wade just infused into his body a little bit, and he just started denying the three-point shot altogether. But um, he needs, like 2.5 is not out of the realm of possibility for him, and I think it's something that's necessary. I think you brought up this number before. I mean, if if you can get like four to five three-point attempts per game between Bam and Jimmy, that's probably the sweet spot number and what this team needs. And I think it's a great point. Um, and so I think that's where we're going to be. And, and if Jimmy could just take again, two and a half, that, that to me is, is a feasible number and very realistic and he can make, he makes the shots. He can make them. Yeah. So, yeah. um, it's there. Uh, all right, let's do one more here. 26 in offensive rating, real or fake? Oh, unfortunately I think it's real. I think it'll climb. I just think that they'll always be at, at least below 
average in terms of their offense. I, I again, I think if they're sixteenth, we'd probably all take that gladly, and it's still going to be below at league average. So I, I just I think it's unfortunately real. Um, I think you and I are saying the same thing. I'm going to say fake because I don't think they'll be as bad as twenty six. I think they could peak at like twentieth. But you and I are saying the same thing that they'll be about below average. Their offensive rating against the Lakers with Jimmy Butler actually caring was one hundred nine point one. <laughs> which would rank about 20th right now. So it's better than 26, uh, but it's still, um, you know, if you're looking on the bright side of things. Um, All right, Udonis Haslam back with the Miami Heat in a new role. We'll talk about that next here on Locked on Heat. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. With the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League, a league created specifically for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, you can go LeBron James and Travis Kelsey at a 10.5 combo of three-pointers made and receptions. If you want to play alongside some of Price Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, you can now find community plays under the Promos tab of the app to view entries for the sum of the biggest names in the Price Picks community each week. Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries can stay in play even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games. If you have a player who exits the game in the first half and is not returned for the second, that player gets rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So right now, make sure you download the Prize Picks app. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code locked on NBA. That's L O C K E D O N N B A for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's right. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match. Prize picks making daily fantasy sports easy. Thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Every day is make sure you tune in Wednesday night, Thursday morning for our post game show of tonight's game in Memphis. Hmm. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. We're going to jump no, into the mailbag here. No algorithm today? Nothing to look forward to in that Memphis we, matchup? Uh, if we have some time at the end, maybe we'll do an algorithm. Okay. I haven't Fair really enough. enjoyed watching Memphis much this year. So I think Half their roster's on the injured list. Like, I, I don't know. Desmond Bain and Jaron Jackson, I mean, they're not random scrub heat killers, but I can imagine both of them will probably have pretty big games. There isn't yeah, much prize other picks, else. Prize Picks has uh, Bain at 23.5 points per game or yeah. points tonight. Um, it seems like a lot, but they also have like Marcus Smart at 12 and a half points, and I kind of like there the over go. on that. Yeah, uh, they have Bam at 20 and a half points. We know how Bam mm. feels about Jaron Jackson Jr. in that matchup. He's also yeah. at 33.5 points plus rebounds, point plus assists. And I might take you could take both of those, and I think that'd be a good bet. Um, all right, Phil writes in, Are we excited about Udonis Haslam's new role in the front office, David? Just uh, sort of context here. Udonis Haslam on Tuesday was named Vice President of Basketball Development. Haslam's responsibilities, according to the press release, include being a resource to the coaching staff, mentoring both Heat and Skyforce players as well as representing the organization in the community and in business endeavors. David, it just sounds like what he was doing for free, but now he's getting paid. Right. I think there's just a name attached to the position, which he's been filling basically for the past 10 years. I don't know if excitement quite sums up my feeling on it but it just kind of makes sense and this was the right decision i think ud's happy i think the team's happy i think we'll see still you know continue to see him on broadcasts and things of that sort mm. it's an expanded role but i don't think it really changes much i think he wants to continue doing something similar to what he's done in terms of being that go between players and the coaches in front office because he's so he's been here for so long and he's such a powerful voice on both sides of the organization whether it's the front office or amongst the players in the locker room and i think it's just going to be an extension of that so i guess excitement is a good as good a word as any but it just makes so much sense for ud to fill this particular role in this way i'm excited I'll use that word. I think this is All great. Right. Put him in an official position. We remember when Dwayne Wade left the organization. Everybody kind of wanted him to be a part of it. And when you're yes. out there in just the gravitational pull of things and you have no official position with the with the team, you're just kind of floating out there. You end up being the, a part owner of the Utah Jazz. We don't want that for you, Donis Haslam. So uh, you, you, you keep him in-house here. Is he coming for Alonzo Morning's job? I don't know. I have no idea what's going on. Mm-hmm. It kind of sounded a little bit like what Zoe was going on, but Zoe's not playing in practice. Uh, at all either and he's not doing a player development thing anymore so that's more of Udonis Haslam's role yeah. I think he'll he'll be at that table at practice where Pat Riley and Zoe and Andy Ellisberg and Adam Simon and Eric Spolster hang out like he'll be part of that table now 
Uh, I think the person most excited about this, though, is Eric Spolstra. He he loves Udonis Haslam, keeps talking about having him around, and I think uh, I think if anybody's excited, it's him. Daniel yeah, writes in, can we start calling this phase one of the BAM and Hero build? This is an interesting concept. What do you think? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not quite ready to call it that just because Jimmy Butler is still clearly your best player. Like he, Whatever we've seen from him over the regular season, not just this year and beyond, I, I still think that he gives you your best chance at winning when it matters most in the postseason. So I, I know that you're going to need more from Bam and Tyler in order to improve your chances at a title. But it's just it's, it's still Jimmy's team, and I think it should be Jimmy's team until we start to see a noticeable drop off in postseason play again, where it matters most. And and I think the same thing could apply in the other way towards Tyler in particular. Like we need to see him be able to carry his game to another level in the postseason for us to say, okay, now the team's in good hands because we know what Bam can do in the playoffs. And I know he'll get criticized for it because he's not necessarily an offensive force, but he does raise his game. He plays better defensively. He does more offensively in these big games. And I think he's shown that he can be a, a centerpiece for the future of this yes. team. But when it comes to whose team it is, it's still Jimmy's team very much. So um, agreed on all fronts. Uh, is Tyler hero, a very good role player on a very good team, or is he a guy who could be a big two with Bam and Tyler? Uh, in the or, or yeah, with Bam Adebayo in the future after kind of Jimmy Butler's time in Miami is over, right? That's the big question. Tyler Hero is 24 years old. Yeah. When when Jimmy Butler has that player option 2025, 20, 26, he'll probably pick it up if he's not signed to an extension before that. It's worth 52 million dollars. The following year, he's an unrestricted free agent. In the year 2026, is Jimmy Butler still even in the NBA at that point? I I don't really I don't know. Yeah. I don't, that's not really what the point of this conversation. But in 2026, the only players under contract for Miami. Right now, are Tyler Hero, um, Jaime Hakez, and Nikola Jovic will have some restricted free agents decisions to make. Uh, Bam Adebayo would be a free agent at that point, although he's extension eligible next summer, and I expect him to sign an extension next summer, uh, or, or within the next two summers, I should say. Within the next two yeah. years, he'll sign an extension. So I don't think he'll ever hit free agency in 2026. And Jimmy Butler will be gone at that point. I think he'll be, whatever, 38 years old. He'll probably be retired at that point. So you've got... Bam and Tyler Hero, that's sort of the rebuild phase, right? That's when you really have to start considering, okay, this is Bam and Tyler's team now if both of those guys are still on the roster. But I do think right now there is an interesting sort of two-timeline thing happening, and Golden State was criticized yeah. for doing this, but rightly so. I thought it was a dumb idea um, because they had Steph, and I thought they should just go for it. Um, but right now, the Heat, we've talked about this a lot, are sort of straddling the line of, what can we do to maximize Jimmy Butler's window while not giving up on the Bam Tyler Hero window in the future? Mm. And really, we might, might, maybe it's just worth calling it the Bam out of bio window, and then like maybe Tyler Hero is part of that kitchen set. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. it's um, it is a thing that they have to they have to consider. So um, I don't know if it means it's phase one or if it's sort of like in planning. But that's yeah. sort of where we're at. I mean, he was he was going to be traded this offseason. It's kind of a big jump mm. to say from a player that they were willing to trade to, well, now you're taking over the team and you're going to carry us for the next you know 10 years, however long that my, that career might last. So I don't think we're there yet, but we could start to see the inkling, the beginnings of something forming, at least in this organization. Let's do this one quick. Brian writes in, did James Harden prove why the Heat were not interested in trading for him in the Clippers intro press conference and then I'll add and his debut uh, on Monday night, just for those who need a little bit more context. Yeah. Uh, James Harden asked in his intro press conference some sort of question, and he said, "I'm it, or like, how does he play in a system with Kawhi and Paul George and, and Russell Westbrook?" He said, uh, "I am, uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't I'm not play a system in a, player. I'm not a system player. I am I'm a system. A yeah, a very Jay Z. I'm not a businessman. I'm a businessman kind of vibes right. there. What did you think of that, David?" I think it was exactly problematic and part of the reason why they didn't take him uh, on this team or didn't want to make a, take a flyer. Like read Howard Beck's piece uh, via The Ringer mm -hmm. on the problems of, of James Harden and his respective legacy. And I, I think it makes very many good points and it's very well written. Uh, and I think, yes, I think the Heat were probably scared that he wouldn't buy in, that he would be pursuing something uh, selfish at one point or another, whether it's the contract, whether it's just that more possessions, He's not the type of guy, never has he ever been the type of guy uh, to just kind of see to right. others and kind of fit into a system. And that's part of the problem is that he's put up really good numbers on teams that gave him full control. And then he still wanted more when those teams changed direction. So I think it's always going to be a problem with him. 
The debut was a little clunky. Uh, I'm not ready to make any sweeping conclusions because he hasn't right. played basketball in months. But uh, him and Kawhi, I don't. That doesn't seem like a fit to me uh, very much. But we'll see what we'll see what happens. I guess. Um, all right. Yeah. Coming up next, should the Heat be in the market for a new point guard? We got names, David. That's coming up here uh -huh. on Locked On Heat. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Score early this NFL and NBA season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get on the action. West, the Dolphins are off this weekend. What do you got going on? Anything, uh, anything, any particular bets that you're looking at? After – I am not. No, if the Dolphins are off, I think I'm going to take this weekend of NFL football off. Uh, I think I just need it after what happened in Germany. Well, you know, you can always blame it on the international travel. Why not? Uh, maybe they just weren't getting the calls or something like that. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. Go visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL and NBA season. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL and NBA. Thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Every day is tune in after tonight's game against the Grizzlies for our post-game show, including, hopefully, the handing out of credit cookies. If not, then we're going to be handing out some blade pie. We'll get your listener questions uh, and our biggest takeaways of the game. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube and your favorite podcast app. Continuing on with the mailbag, before we get to this question about some potential point guard targets, let's get to this one from Andrew, who writes in, I was really impressed with Jaime Hawkins Jr. today. Big rip from LeBron. Great pass in traffic. Uh, a good spot up three. Where does he rank defensively on the roster? He typically had the hardest assignment, especially of the second unit. I'm hoping Caleb Martin takes Josh Richardson and Kyle Lowry's minutes, and Hero is playing at point guard. So a lot to get into uh, in that question, but I'm most interested in that part about where he ranks defensively on this roster, Jaime Hawkins Jr. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I think I'd still have him a step behind Caleb Martin. I don't think he's at the Jimmy Butler or Bam at a bio levels yet. Both of those are all NBA type defenders, but I, I guess I'd have him above Kyle and below Caleb in terms of overall defensive ranking there, which would probably make him the fourth uh, best defender. Highsmith, forgetting Highsmith. Oh, sorry. How can I no. forget H? Uh, yeah, uh, I've got him. I've got fifth. Fifth. That's good. That's one, fair. two, three, four, five. It depends on what you think of Orlando Robinson. It's just tough to compare a wing defender versus a center. I think Orlando Robinson is a good defender. Um, yeah. uh, so it, it's sort of like, all right, do you go big man, do you go perimeter guy. Uh, I guess in today's NBA, you would probably just go perimeter guy for versatility's sake. I got Bam, Jimmy, Caleb, Highsmith. And if you want to yeah. debate the Caleb Highsmith thing, that's fine. I don't care. I'm not that interested in doing it. But those two guys behind Bam and Jimmy. And then probably Hakez after that, which is saying a lot. Uh, and it's unfortunately, it's a great mark for Jaime Hakez Jr., right? It's a little bit of a tough reflection on guys like Kyle Lowry and Josh Richardson, who are guys that you typically rely on for defense. But I think at both of their stages in this career, Kyle Lowry 37, Josh Richardson 31, probably not as stout uh, at the point of attack as Hakez is. Um, it's not like, I thought his effort on LeBron was fine. I think LeBron was like three or four, three of four or three of five on his shots against Hakez, according to the matchup data. Sometimes that matchup data isn't totally like reflective right, of the effort the whole story. put in. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's also LeBron who's just going to make, you know, is maybe the greatest player of all time because he can make difficult shots. But um, look, defensively, he's been awesome. Uh, let's, let's explore that little thing about Caleb Martin though, because he hasn't played yet this season. You look at the rotation. I think we're in an interesting point now. He, uh, Highsmith has played uh, or started now the last two games. The starting lineup for Miami is Lowry, Tyler Hero, Jimmy Butler, Haywood Highsmith, and Bam Adebayo. The first four off the bench, the four guys that Spo is using, Josh Richardson, Duncan Robinson, Jaime, and Thomas Bryant. Caleb Martin is going to get time when he comes back. Um, and I do wonder whose time he's going to take, and I kind of think it's going to be Josh. I think it's going to be Josh Richardson. Yeah, I, you know, the fourth quarter against the Lakers really showed how much faith Eric Spolstra still has in Josh and and both you That's and I agreed point. it was it was kind of unfounded because I don't think Josh was doing much positively yet it's not to say that he won't but I think much like Thomas Bryant they're both still kind of trying to figure out how to fit into this particular team and how to do those small little things how to be in the right position how to how to be there or set up the next shot or make that right play 
they're just not quite aware yet. And I don't know why that is. Both of them kind of journeymen at, at some point. Like, you know, I know that Brian spent a long time with the Wizards. He's still a young player for as long yeah. as he's been in the career. He's, he spent most of his career with the Wizards, then to the Lakers, and then to the, the Nuggets. But he's still kind of just trying to figure out how he can make an impact. And I think Josh, as familiar as he said he was with the system and everything else, this is a completely different team because now you've got Jimmy Butler. It's not Dwayne Wade, no Hassan Whiteside, you know, making up for your mistakes. You got Bam switching everything. And there are possessions there where Josh wasn't fully aware what to do defensively. Like, I think he might be a better fit in zone type defense, but mm. when it comes to like the switch heavy defense that Miami typically runs, I think he's still kind of figuring out exactly when to the, and that speaks to him and whoever else is on the floor with them, because they've got to be more vocal about when to make those switches and when to pick up somebody else so that you don't get blown right. by and create an opportunity at the rim. And it's not just defensively. Josh Richardson offensively no has doubt. not made much of an impact of any kind. And Caleb Morton's ceiling offensively is just higher than what Josh Richardson's ceiling, right? Like we yeah. saw in the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't expect Caleb to come in and average 19 points per game, but if he can give Pretty you nice. 9 to 10, which is what he averaged last year, that's more than what Josh Richardson is giving you. And we just talked about Miami's issues offensively. If you're going to get to like average-ish on offense, you're just going to need more from everybody on the roster, whether it's Jimmy Butler to Josh Richardson or Caleb Martin or, or whoever. So, um, yeah, uh, let's do this. Are we, are we kind of, quick aside here, I know maybe this isn't quite a mailbag question, but are we overstating Caleb Martin's value as a free agent? Because between the games missed here, the fact that he was virtually out of the league a few seasons ago, and the possibility of him sharing time with Josh Richardson, who just signed a veteran minimum, may have had more lucrative offers elsewhere, but probably not really. Is Caleb Martin still a guy? I mean, after the finals and the playoff run, I think we thought him being more like a 10 to 12, maybe even a 15 million a year type guy. Yeah, Is that overstated maybe? And he could possibly be a guy that Miami could bring this back much more cheaply? This season is going to be really important in answering that exact question, David. I, and, and in terms of sharing minutes with Josh, I don't think he's sharing minutes with anybody. I think he's just going to get the job. And um, I think we're, we're going to end up in a spot where Josh Richardson's just not in the rotation anymore, right? And just like Kevin Love, like you have to make tough decisions uh, right now. And Kevin Love was starting for you, and now he's out of the rotation. I think we're going to see something similar happen with Josh Richardson here. And maybe even Kyle Lowry as we go further and further into this season. I mean, these things are possibilities. Um, but yeah, this season is a big one. I don't think anything is guaranteed in terms of uh, his free agency um, that's coming up. George writes in, with the Wizards being so bad this season, and boy, are they, they are bad. Um, yeah. Should the Heat consider snatching Tyus Jones? David, I'm all over this idea. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a great one. I just don't, I don't know what Miami would potentially offer in exchange for Jones or why the Wizards would feel compelled to do it. Like he's a young player they could potentially, I mean, I think you could bring him back and let him do whatever he does in the Wizards. I, they have no aspirations for the playoffs. So I don't see why they would keep him unless you just bowl him over for a hell of an offer. And that kind of puts Miami in a bad place because that forces them to give up assets that they do not want to give mm. up in terms of doing so. But, I mean, if you're ready to cut ties from Nikola Jovic, who doesn't seem like he has a clear path to playing time here in Miami, they're looking to rebuild, give him more opportunities. They'll probably make some other trades. Maybe they'll trade Kyle Kuzma. Who knows? That kind of opens the possibility up. I could see it working out. So, Tyus Jones has one year and $14 million left on his contract. I'm going to go out on a limb, and unless the Wizards max him out, I don't think he's going back there. I don't think that he wants to go back there. <laughs> um, bold, bold take, man. Yeah, he's like, Jordan Poole is just doing silly things all the time on the court. I want to go somewhere serious, please. Thank you. Um, I love the idea of throwing Jovic in there instead of a draft pick. Uh, okay. If you're the Heat, I I don't love the idea of parting with Nico. I, I, I really think his ceiling is pretty high, but if you're not yeah. able by like the deadline – or maybe even January to really find where it is that he's going to fit. Uh, and if you're not behind the scenes, seeing the development that you want to see, then maybe it's worth saying, okay, maybe instead of giving up a 2028 or a 2020 or a 2030 first, maybe we just give up on Jovic and send him somewhere where he's, he's going to be able to play Washington. He'll be able to play. Um, they let a lot of guys play through mistakes there apparently. So um, you could put him with Kyle Lowry's expiring and that's a $32 million package. You bring $14 million of Tyus Jones back. You're not able to get Kuzma in that, but could you throw in a, a Landry Shamit? I mean, that's and then you could, and then you could probably throw in like a Danilo Gallinari, and that pretty much gets you there. So you Ooh. would basically trade Jovic and Lowry for Gallo, Shamit, and Tyus Jones. I don't love that. Um, I, I would actually rather probably just keep Jovic, but um, could you trade Lowry and a first? 
for Tyus Jones and some salary. And now we're just getting into like trade machine stuff. And there's ways that like the Wizards have a bunch of stackable salaries, but the thing is it would add some long-term money to Miami's cap sheet. I don't know that Miami is willing to do that for Tyus Jones. As good as Tyus Jones is, I think he's a very good point guard who could play in a playoff setting, which is the kind of players that Miami is obviously looking for. Um, I think they should explore it. I don't know if it's going to happen. Hey, $14 million, he could get bought out if things go south in Washington. Absolutely. Maybe, uh, on an expiring. And if that's the case, I would really be knocking on door. I don't know that there's a whole lot of contending teams that, or even just playoff teams, if we want to consider Miami uh, a playoff team, that can offer starting point guard minutes off the buyout. You know what I mean? So maybe that's something that that makes some sense. Um, all right. Thanks for making Locked on Heat your first listen every day. Every day is tune in tonight. After the game, uh, for our post-game show, we're going to be handing out credit cookies or maybe blame pie. Getting to your questions that you send in on Twitter, and we'll have our biggest takeaways from the game. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow us on your podcast app.